beautiful song. I like the acapella version better. But it's very, very heartwarming. Touch me. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for all you do. We thank you most of all for Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross. Father, help us to, as Paul would say, we only preach Christ and him crucified. May we each be uh, mindful of what he's done for us. We pray that you send your Holy Spirit to each heart today, that each one would hear the message from on high, Father. They would not hear my words, but they would hear yours. We thank you, we praise you, because you're worthy of our thanks and praise. And Father, we want to give you all the glory. In his name we pray. Amen. You know, it breaks my heart. And, uh, when God gets blamed for, for what Satan has done to this world, it breaks my heart when People are upset with God because of a sick loved one or someone's dying or because the world has their backs turned to God. And God is, is doing with everything in His power. In uh, Revelation 3.21, in Revelation 3.20, he, he says that He is knocking on the door of everyone's heart. Everybody's heart is getting a knock on the door, but not everybody hears the knock. Our God is a, is a God of mercy. He's also a God of justice. And He's trying to, I've heard it said in the spirit of prophecy, that, that mercy and justice kissed each other. I think that's, that, that's an incredible, incredible thing that when, when you boil it down to uh, how much God loves the human race. I forgot to put the name of my sermon into you. I, I, you know, sometimes I forget to put things in the sermon. I am the bulletin secretary, so one of these days I might fire myself. But you know, I'm too selfish to fire myself because I, I love control over the bulletin, and, and I'll, I'll admit that I, I love it. I love the control over the bulletin because I, I can uh, I can push my agenda, and I, I praise God I, that God's agenda is my agenda. I pray that it would always be that way, and, and if I get to big for my britches, he'll take me out. And I had promised God uh, long ago that I would not move myself, that he would have to move me. And that's why I'm standing up here. Because Amen. a lot of times, I don't want to be here. And I, 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 I love y'all. But sometimes it's, it's, it's tough, not just not being in the pulpit, but being, uh, and I, I don't want to use that word loosely, a pastor. I, uh, I love that. And I, I, I never expected to be here. And that's all, that, that's all the commercial I own. Yeah, I didn't mean to go that direction. Um, I want to get focused on my sermon. And the, my sermon title was going to be called God is Love. And if I'm not speaking clearly and you're not understanding me, ask me to stop and speak clearly. Because I listen to my sermons sometimes when, I'm, when they, they, they put them online. And I'm almost embarrassed because... I can't, I'm, ha I'm having to, to lean in to even understand myself. Maybe between my lips and your ears, maybe God allows you to hear me. And uh, that's, that's, that's a miracle, the gift of tongues and the gift of hearing. But the, the, the title of my sermon, uh, John 3.16, is it, 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 really a, a, a verse that, that you can kick many sermons from, kick off many sermons from John 3.16. For God so loved the world. Uh, when you think, when you look at that word "world" in the Greek, it's cosmos, and that's all inclusive. God so loved the world, and uh, I've got so many things to say. But this is supposed to be a sermonette. It's, it's going to be real quick. Anyway, how, how many people have seen this picture right here? Can you see it? I, I just love that picture. But I just found out today that this lighthouse is off the coast of France. And this individual, of course, well, he lived to tell about this day. And uh, it's just an incredible thing. But the sermon, sermon illustration is that the waters 
are the sins in our lives that are trying to overtake us and to crush us. But Jesus is the lighthouse, and He's also the rock who protects us. And we, we have to uh, allow Jesus to take care of us. I mean, that's an incredible uh, lighthouse built on the rock. Because if it wasn't built on the rock, it wouldn't be there. I, lo I, I have this sitting in my office, and, and when I start feeling down on my stuff, I look up there and I, I think of Jesus protecting me. Anyway, that's not part of my sermon. It's just, it's just three. <laughs> But it, it kind of is part of my sermon because today we're going to, today we're having communion. And I, I don't want to talk about communion yet, but I'm going to talk about it towards the end of my sermon. Um, I, I don't even, sometimes I don't even want to call it a sermon, I just want to call it a, a talk. Um, now, when Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, uh, I believe it was in John chapter, I don't have my sermon notes, believe it or not, I left them at home again. I think God does it on purpose because I have to speak from my head and my heart. And uh, it's in John 14, I believe it's verse 9, where he, uh, Philip is asking Jesus, you know, show us the Father. And Jesus says, haven't you seen the Father? And uh, he's, a, he's a, a little bit concerned that that the, the, the disciples have not seen the Father. He says, when you see me, you've seen the Father. And what I want to look at is uh, in, in Genesis chapter 2. And did everybody get a spirit of prophecy quote? It's not highlighted like mine. You can barely see the highlight on yours. Uh, I, when I read, I like for people to follow along because... Sometimes I kind of leave words out and mispronounce words. And I'd like for you to get the full meaning of it when I, when I do read. If you don't have one, uh, Donald will bring you one. Does everybody have a, a paper? That is, if I have time to get to it, we may run out of time. Uh, we're in uh, Genesis chapter 2. And we're in verse, I want to start with verse 15. But, then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend it and to keep it. Now, I want to stop here just and just mention what the word keep means. It means to uh, protect. It means to cherish. It means to uh, appreciate. It means to guard. When God asks us to keep His Ten Commandments, it's the same as when He asked our, uh, Adam to keep the garden. He wants us to cherish His commandments. He wants us to appreciate His commandments. God wants to uh, woo us and not drive us. And that's the difference between evil and good. Good wants to, to draw us. Evil wants to drive us. And it says, And the Lord God, this is verse 16, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in that day you eat of it, I'm going to kill you. Nope. Is that what it says? He says that you will surely die. Now I want you to take your mind to the to the to uh, to when Jesus is in the upper room and he's washing the feet of the disciples and he's washing Judas's feet and Judas is his betrayer. I want you to, to think about that. When you think of the Old Testament, now it, it, it's, it's upsetting when people say that God is a God of uh, vengeance. Yes, He is a God of vengeance. But you, you, if you don't understand the sin problem, then you can't understand God's vengeance. Mm. Amen. Now, I lost my train of thought. 
He'll come back. He's washing the feet of Jesus, of Judas. Judas is, Jesus is washing the feet of Judas. And if you look at in the Old Testament where, where God has got to destroy a nation of people, He has always warned this nation, nation of people. And, and, and this is why I said when, when he says, when you've seen, Philip, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So this is Jesus washing the feet of his betrayer. Now, Jesus is God. Amen. And he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if he's going to wash Judas' feet, do you think he's going to the Amalekites, the, the Jezusites, all the, all the bad guys? can't name them all, that we would call bad guys. He doesn't just kill them because he's upset with them, because he's mad with them. He is being merciful, if you understand the sin problem. God is being merciful. These people are so steeped in sin, and may I add, for the back of, lack of better words, my own words, they're miserable. And God is putting them out of their misery. Maybe somebody could say that better than I just said. But God is not, he is, he is trying to get everybody into heaven. If you go and read in Isaiah, when he is trying to, uh, he's, he's trying to get everyone into heaven. Uh, I, I want to go there, but I, I don't have time. In, in Isaiah, he talks about bringing in the people that are, his, that are of Israel. Anyway, I'm going to move on. So, what I believe what God could say here when He says, "In that day you eat, you shall surely die." If you understand God is love, what God is saying to the human race is, "I am going to die." That breaks my heart. God is putting Himself on trial here. I, if, if someone wants to make a comment, feel free. If you disagree with me, feel free to, to make a comment. God loves us so much, we, and you can really see that if you go through a chapter in the Desire of Ages called the Gethsemane. And I have part of that. That's part of what you have. It, the handout you have. I'm not going to read all of this. We don't have time to read it all. But I would, I would uh, encourage you to read this whole chapter of Gethsemane. I didn't encourage you to read all of, all of uh, Desire of Ages. But that, that was one thing that I wanted to uh, point out before, we, before I read this. And this is really, I'm too lazy to make a PowerPoint, so I just made, I just made a copy of it. But I want to go to uh, first selected messages. If I was more computer literate, I could probably get right there. And this is Miss White. She's writing. She says, I have made... She says, I have... I have had no claims to make, only that I am instructed that I am the Lord's messenger, that He called me in my youth to be His messenger. And this is, uh, if anybody just wants to look it up right now, it's the first selected message, it's page 32.1. That He called me in my youth to be His messenger, to receive His word, and to give a clear, decided message in the name of the Lord Jesus. Early in my youth, I was asked several times, Are you a prophet? I have ever responded, I am the Lord's messenger. I know that many have called me a prophet, but have made no claim to this title. Wow. My Savior declared me to be His messenger. Your work, He instructed me, is to bear my word. Strange things will arise in your youth. I set you apart to bear the message to the erring ones, 
to carry the word before unbelievers and with pen and voice to reprove those from the word actions that are not right. From the word actions that are not right, the, the word is capitalized. Exhort from the word, I will make my word open to you. It shall not be as a strange language. In the true eloquence of simplicity with, the vo with voice and pen, the messages I give shall be heard from one who has never learned in the schools. Miss White graduated third grade. My spirit and my power shall be with you. And this is really where it gets heavy. It says, Be not afraid of man, for my shield shall protect you. It is not you that speaketh. It is the Lord that giveth the messages of warning and reproof. Never deviate from the truth under any circumstances. So this is the greater light speaking to the lesser light. But listen to what he says. The messages for these days, the messages for these last days shall be written in books, plural, and shall stand immortalized to testify against those who have once rejoiced in the light, but who have been led to give it up because of the seductive influences of evil. Amen. To the, to the piece of paper, it says, and I, I'm only going to read part of the highlighted part, and you may, you may be able to tell some of it is highlighted in yours. It says, and th I've already discussed this, but I just want to point it out again. There is comfort and peace in the truth, but no real peace or comfort can be found in falsehood. It is through false theories and traditions that Satan gains his power over the mind. Wow. So, if we're blaming God for what Satan is doing, uh, it's not God, it's Satan. If you look at the world, our world is a messed up place. Only because of selfishness. And down in the next highlighted area it says, The Holy Spirit was the highest gift. The Holy Spirit was the highest of all gifts that He could solicit from the Father for the explanation of His people. The Spirit was given to, the Spirit was to be given as a regenerating agent. And without the sacrifice of Christ would have been no avail. That is powerful. And I'm skipping a line. It says, Sin could be resisted and overcome only through the mighty agency of the third person of the Godhead. If you have a problem with the Trinity, you have a problem with the spirit of prophecy. And down a little bit further, in, in a, it's... In the next highlighted area, it says, The preaching of the Word will be of no avail without the continual presence and aid of the Holy Spirit. So, with this, with the Spirit of Prophecy, it, it is of no avail without the Holy Spirit. We have got to, be, we have, got to have the Holy Spirit. We cannot use the Holy Spirit down in the last part that I highlighted. We cannot use the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is to use us. Through the Spirit, God works in His people to will and to do of His good pleasure. Philippians 2.13 But many will submit, will not submit to this. They, manage, they want to manage themselves. This is why they do not receive the heavenly gift. Only to those who wait humbly upon God and who watch for His guidance and grace is the Spirit given. And I love this last, well, the next to the last line. It says, The power of God awaits their demand and reception. This promise, this promise blessing claimed by faith brings all other blessings in its train. I love that. If you have the Holy Spirit. That, and that, that was the one thing that I, I really love what Jesus said in the upper room. He says that He promised to send the Holy Spirit. He says, this was his greatest gift to the human race. Was his promised Holy Spirit. Amen. Yeah. 
If God is love, why doesn't He just fix everything? Then we're back to the sin problem. God wants to have fellowship with each one of us. But if He came in this room right now, most of us would be consumed by His by him because he is a consuming fire. So how is he going to fix this problem? You know, it all goes back into in, into uh, when he made Adam. When he made Adam, if you read, it says that he breathed into Adam the breath of life. That's why most Bibles say it. But if you read the, uh, the the Hebrew, it is the masculine plural. If you read it like that, it says that God breathed the breath of lives into Adam. Every person that was ever created, or every person that's ever been born, was created in Adam. Every person that's ever been born was in Adam. Even Eve was in Adam. And when he, when God made Eve, he took a rib from Adam and he made Eve. He didn't have to breathe the breath of life into Eve even because the, the rib he took was already alive. But if you read in Acts 17, 26, it says that all men came from one blood. So we all came from Adam. So the problem is when Adam sinned, we were in Adam. We were part of Adam. Whether we like it or not, it, we are condemned because of Adam. We're not guilty of Adam's sin, but we are condemned. And the only way God could fix the human race, the only way I can describe this, and, and, it, and it, does, it, it may not make sense to you because it's, it barely makes sense to me, how God can uh, take... Whenever you touch one of the human race, guess what? If you... When God made Adam and you touch Adam, you, Adam means mankind. If you touch Adam, you're touching the whole human race. If you touch one of us, you're actually touching the whole human race. I don't understand that, but it's to me, the, only, the best way I can describe it is the human race is like a stream. We're all one. And we're all, we're, we're all one in Adam. But when Jesus came and He was born of a woman at the Incarnation, I don't know how God did it, but He took Himself and plugged Himself right into, the, into that stream. Well, guess what? When He plugged Himself into that stream, it touched the whole human race. It said, that's why we can say, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. The world. If you look at Romans 5.18, and let's go there. Now, that's where I want to close. That's where I want to end up. You know, I started to tell this the last time, my last sermon, and I, and I left the, the best part out. I guess I, I got in too big of a hurry. But in Romans 5.18, it says, it, I'll give everybody a second to get there, whoever wants to turn there. It says, Therefore, As through one man's offense, judgment came to all men. Now, who was that? Who was that one man? Adam. Resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to how many men? All. All men. Resulting in what? Justification of life. That word justification only happens three times in Scripture. One is in chapter 4 of Romans, and I forgot where the other one is. But it's dikaiosis. And that word dikaiosis means declared right. When Jesus came into this world, He declared, He justified the whole human race. Does that mean everybody's going to heaven? Romans, I'm sorry, John 3. 16 is what our verse was today. If you go to Romans chapter 3, verse 18, it'll tell you the problem. 
says, He who believes in, in, in Him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So, by unbelief, we're just, we are, we are, uh, I had a word that's gone. We are disqualified from eternal life by unbelief. God, for God so loved the world that He gave. He didn't loan, He gave His only begotten Son. That whosoever should believe in Him should not perish. perish. Ray, Ray told somebody earlier not to use a P's in the microphone. Sorry. Just step away. <laughs> but should not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen. That is my life, my, that is my wish for each one in, the, in the, the sound of my voice. And to know that God loves you dearly. And He is not responsible for the bad things in this world. Satan is responsible for the bad things in this world. Amen. And one day, God is going to lay the sins of the people on Satan. In this world, and, and, and things are going to wrap up. Amen. 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 Thank you. We're going to break for our communion service. We're going to do our foot washing first. And I'd like to say on the out, out before we go in that uh, the only ones who are unwelcome for the uh, communion service are those that are in open sin. I can tell you the truth, I don't know anybody in here in open sin. And uh, it says that everybody's invited to, uh, to participate in the communion service. But it also says in, uh, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. There is hope as a... Uh, our friend uh, Lowell would say, and there's hope for you. Uh, 1127, it says, Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and, let, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Jesus did not cut Judas off. He knew his betrayer, but yet he had the Last Supper with, with his betrayer. Um, when we go in for the foot washing, it's not just for going in. We're, we're going in, and each one of us is to examine ourselves before God. That we'll, as, we, as we go through this foot washing, it's a cleansing of the heart. It's a cleansing of sins. And I believe that that's very important. Before we come back in for the communion. So find it in your heart to speak to Jesus while we're out for the foot watch. As he would say, examine yourself. Or Paul said that, examine yourself. Okay, when we come back in, if we could sit every other row because it's easier for the ushers to uh, give out the, uh, the bread and the wine. Starting where? Starting with the I don't know. Where do we start? This, this is my first time. Start with the back row. Fill up the back row. Okay. All right, everybody. The ladies will go behind the blue door. Is that correct? And the, the gentlemen will meet in the uh, social hall for, for foot washing.